<clears throat> Greetings folks, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina. And friends, I come out here this evening to preach the gospel of grace to you, to exalt the grace of God in salvation, in the salvation of souls through His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm here to, to make known the glories of Christ that are revealed in Scripture concerning that Jesus, the, the, concerning the fact that Jesus has died for His people and that He has been raised to new life. He's been raised to life on the third day, friends. And He is the true and living God. And He deserves worship and praise. And friends, I'm here to warn you about the wrath of God which is to come, which will soon come upon the wicked. Those who reject the Gospel, those who reject the saving grace of God, I'm here to call out sin, yes, to make much of sin. But it is so that I may, may make much of my Savior. That I may make much of the One who redeems from the power of sin and the effect of sin. Who saves the sinner from slavery to sin. For if you are outside of Christ this evening, friends, then you're the slave to sin. Jesus said those very things in John 8. But however, He said, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Friends, if Christ Jesus sets your soul free, then you will be free indeed and no longer a slave to sin as I once was. And ultimately, I come out here out of a desire to worship God, out of a, a, des out of a desire to exalt God in the public sphere, to, to exalt the grace of God and the holiness of God and the wisdom of God. For the Gospel of Jesus Christ is a glorious truth. There is no truth that quite compares to the glory of the Gospel because it shows us the wisdom of God and the brilliance of our Creator. That God would so bring about the salvation of His people in such a way so as to bring His name all the glory. I love what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says in verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And I love it what he says at the end of the chapter in verse 30. He says, But by His doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boast, boasts in the Lord. Friends, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ shows us the brilliance of God, the wisdom of God, and it, therefore it is that Gospel that I seek to make known this evening with clarity and precision that you might be saved from your sins. And even this Gospel is not only for the lost, but for saints, for the people of God to be encouraged. And wherever this Gospel is preached, God is surely exalted. God is honored when the Gospel of His Son is preached. And so therefore, I seek to do that this evening. The text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to is out of the book of Romans. The book of Romans in chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, the Apostle Paul is writing here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And he writes these words. He says, What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This text speaks to the reality that no matter how sinful men are, the grace of God, the faithfulness of God overrides such wickedness. And specifically, the example that is given forth in this text is concerning the nation of Israel. That the Jewish people, whom Christ was originally sent to, for the most part rejected Him. Yet that did not nullify the faithfulness of God, no. 
For we know that God, according to His gracious choice, kept a remnant unto Himself. God has a remnant unto Himself, friends. In fact, in, in the Old Testament, we find a story of Elijah the prophet who was greatly persecuted for the truth of God, who was, who was greatly persecuted for righteousness' sake. And at one point, he cries out to God in desperation concerning the evildoers in his day who were amongst the Jewish people. And God told Elijah that he had 7,000 men who had not bowed the knee to Baal, who was a false god in his day. God had kept a remnant unto Himself, a select people who would be holy unto Him. And this is a timely word for where we find ourselves today. In the Bible Belt, in the midst of uh, the Biblical South, as some have called it, where there are Christians everywhere, well, supposedly at least, people who say they know Christ, yet they live in blatant rebellion. They live in blatant sin. Such souls are not truly regenerate. Such people are not truly Christ's. But we ask ourselves, does that nullify the faithfulness of God? Does that nullify the sovereign decree of God? Absolutely not. My friends, God is faithful to keep a select few unto Himself. And He does it unto His glory. Just as in the example with Elijah the prophet, God gave the divine answer that He had 7,000 men in Israel who did not bow the knee to Baal. So too it is here in the south. Though there are many religious hypocrites, though there are many who name the name of Christ, but are truly lost inwardly, even in the midst of that, God in His sovereign faithfulness has kept a few unto Himself. In fact, we make a distinction. Theologians, when they discuss this issue, they talk about what is called the visible church. That is the church that we see outwardly. All people who attend churches here in the South and who say they're Christians. And then we talk about the invisible church, which is, of course, the true church of Jesus Christ. My friends, that is the remnant that God has amongst those who claim to be followers of Christ. Even Jesus Himself in Matthew 7 taught concerning this very issue. He says in Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of My Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to Me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name and in Your name cast out demons and in Your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from Me, you who practice lawlessness even from the lips of the, of the greatest teacher in all of Scripture, the Lord Jesus Himself, we find this doctrine brought forth and propounded. This doctrine that there are many who say they know Christ, but they do not. And really amongst the myriads and myriads of crowds that claim to be followers of the Most High God, only a select few truly know Him. Only a select few have been born again as Jesus described it in John 3.3. 3. And friends, it is my desire that if you are in this crowd amongst this great lot of people who are falsely converted, who are self-deceived, who are Christians in name only, it is my desire that God would circumcise your heart, that God would raise you to spiritual life, that God would convert you from your wicked ways to serve Him in righteousness and truth. Amen, brother. God bless you, sir. God bless you, too. God bless you, ma'am. And it is my desire for those who are out here this evening who are in the true people of God, who are, who are true followers of Jesus Christ, to be encouraged. To be encouraged in the faith. As I said earlier, the Gospel of Jesus Christ is for believers. It is for Christians. It is our daily bread. It is the manna from heaven which God gives to us to feed upon day after day. Minute by minute. In fact, any other piety that anyone supposedly has that is not built upon the Gospel, that is not motivated by the Gospel, Amen. such piety is idolatry. God bless you, sir. Any piety that is built upon anything else besides the Gospel is no piety at all. 
It is a false piety. It is an idolatry. That is why the Gospel is so important. It is the, the basis of all piety. The basis of all holiness. It is the only way of salvation. No other message can save your soul, my friends, but the, the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul, even in this book in Romans, says in chapter 1, he says, I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Oftentimes people talk about the Old Testament. And they sometimes spread the lie that the Old Testament says very little concerning Christ, concerning the way of salvation, but such people are great in their ignorance. For the Old Testament Scriptures, just as the New, plainly testify to the glory of Christ, to the saving power of Christ. The prophet Daniel, the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Isaiah, and others, even Moses, wrote about Jesus Christ. They wrote about the coming Messiah, the Redeemer of the elect of God. And friends, it is His Gospel that I seek to make known this evening. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the text of Scripture that I considered just a moment ago that I would like to exegete this evening. I would like to explain what is put forth there. And ultimately to allow that to lead us in a consideration of Gospel truth. But before I do that, my friends, I would like to consider the context of where Paul has come from here in Romans and where he is ultimately going to take this argument that he is making in chapter 3 here. He is just into chapter 2 where he gives a thorough explanation of the need for the religious to have salvation. There are many people who have the outward trappings of religion, but do not have inward religion, do not have true salvific relations with God, are not truly in Christ. And that was one of the issues Paul was dealing with in his day amongst the Jewish people, because they claimed to have the true God, they claimed to have Christ. Or they claim, excuse me, they claimed to have the true God, but they rejected Christ, they rejected the Son of God. And so while they had the outward appearance of religion, they did not have the inward reality. And as I said earlier, this is a timely message for many people who attend churches, even here in Greenville County, who have the outward trappings of religion, but not the inward reality. Not saving faith in Christ. And such people are greatly to be pitied because they are self-deluded and deceived. And so he brings chapter 2 to a close, speaking on in chapter 2 about the inward reality that is an absolute must. If one says they have a relationship with God, there must be an inward reality of that. And then in chapter 3 he begins by saying, and again, the argument was made in chapter 2 specifically concerning the Jewish people. And so he then says in chapter 3, verse 1, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Which was the outward sign of the old covenant amongst the Jewish people. And he says in verse 2, Great in every respect, first of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And we know that, that the prophets, God rose up prophets in their midst. Men in who preached the truth of Scripture. And many of them died for what they preached. We know ultimately that these prophets went on to write great works. The, the, the truth of Scripture itself by the Holy Spirit of God enabling them to write. Inspiring them to write the words that they wrote. And they testified to the glory of the Savior. Of Jesus Christ. And so that's the background to verse 3 here. That's, that's, that's what is right behind this verse. And so Paul ends off that section by speaking on the fact that they had great privilege because they had the oracles of God. And a, and a good parallel to that in our modern day would be, again, going back to modern day churchgoers. There is much light here, my friends. What I mean by that is that truth, my friends, is right at, at, at really everyone's disposal here in the United States. In other nations, if someone were, was to desire to seek after the true God, they could be killed for owning a Bible or for even mentioning Christ according to the way Scripture speaks of Him. 
And so friends, we live in a place that light is at our disposal. God's truth is at our disposal. And yet what do we find? We find great unfaithfulness amongst those who claim to be Christians. God bless you, sir. Great unfaithfulness indeed. And that was the same dilemma among the Jewish people in Paul's day. But listen to what he says in verse 3. He asks the question, and this is what I want to consider, the truth here in these couple of verses. Ultimately, that is the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God is spoken of here in these two verses. He says in verse 3, What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? So here is a rhetorical question. The answer is found within the question itself. And of course, the answer is no. The unbelief of the Jewish people did not nullify the grace of God, did not nullify the ultimate sovereign plan of God to bring about salvation for His people. And even though we live in a place that is filled with hypocrites here in the South, people who say they know Christ, they trample the name of Christ underfoot, they cause the pagans to blaspheme God, to blaspheme Christ, Yet even in that, the faithfulness of God is not thwarted. The ultimate sovereign plan of God is not derailed, friends. No, God will accomplish His purposes for His glory. And my friends, God has a select people whom He chooses to save and whom He wills to save in His Son. Scripture speaks to that reality. And He will see that that comes to pass, the salvation of those people. The triune God is working to bring that about. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are working in glorious unison with one another to bring about the salvation of the people of God. It will not fail. It will not fail. The faithfulness of God does not diminish or increase. It is continual because God is an immutable God. He is unchanging and eternal. It is an impossibility for God to change and so therefore, in relation to His faithfulness, it shall not be moved. It is like a heavy stone set upon the ground that cannot be moved to the left or to the right, friends. And so therefore, we can take heart in knowing that God's sovereign will shall play out even if men set themselves up against Him and set themselves up against the authority of Christ. We know many people do that. We see it all around us. And I know that many of you perhaps do that very thing. However, the will of God shall not be moved. The decree of God will not be changed. Psalm 2 speaks to this reality. Psalm 2 says in verse 1, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to him, to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my King upon Zion, my holy mountain. Friends, no matter how many people set themselves up against the Lord God, His kingdom shall have no end. There will be no end to the rule of Jesus Christ and the reign of the King of glory. And friends, I tell you this, that we can bet our eternity upon Him. We can rely upon Him for our eternal salvation because He, in His sovereign reign, shall not be moved. So going back to Romans chapter 3, we find there, and Paul said that phrase, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? We obviously know it will not. And then he moves on into verse 4 and he says, May it never be. So he just adds on to what he just said to, to further stress this point. No, God in His faithfulness will not fail to keep His promises. 
In fact, that is why I can come out here this evening and call you to trust upon Christ, call you to believe the gospel of grace, because God is perfect in His faithfulness, friends, and God's promises shall not fail. Think about if you were sitting at home this afternoon and someone were to call you up and say that they were from so-and-so bank and list off a couple of credentials to you and then say, Sir, you have just won $300,000. We'd like you to come to our bank and pick it up. And it sounded credible to you and so therefore you believed that person. Friends, if we are so quick to believe the Word of men, how much more should we be quick to, to heed the Word of God and to believe the Word of God? Friends, God's Word is the, is the hook upon which we hang our eternal salvation. You must believe the promises of God. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to Him as righteousness. He credited unto Him. And so, friends, I call you this evening to repent and trust on Christ, to flee the wrath of God which is to come. Christ shed His blood for His people. He satisfied the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God. And my friends, all who believe, all who grab hold of the promises of God as they are revealed in Christ, such people receive the benefits of His work. They receive the fruit of His labor. Friends, that is the glory of the Gospel. That it does not require your religious performance, but it requires firm belief and faith upon the promises of God as they are revealed in Scripture. Paul continues in verse 4 by saying, Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. Again, we, this speaks to the reality that though man has great moral corruption, which he does, Ephesians 2.1 tells us that men are dead in sin. They are haters of God. They are alienated from the life of God. He even talks about in 1 Corinthians that the natural man cannot understand the things of God. He cannot grasp spiritual things. The depravity of man's state is indeed great. However, God remains unstained by the perversion of this sinful world. God is absolutely holy as Scripture describes Him. He is set apart from all that is wicked. In fact, when we say God is good, we either can mean that in two ways. God is good in terms of His benevolence, in that He deals uh, in a very good manner, a, a favorable manner toward people. And then we speak of God's goodness in another sense, and that is His moral character, His moral uh, perfection. And that is what I mean when I say in this context here, Right now, when I say God is good, I'm referencing His moral perfection, my friends. This is what this text is speaking of. And then Paul continues. He quotes an Old Testament text. He says, as it is written. And then he quotes, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Friends, I want to share with you this reality that God in all His ways is perfect. In all His dealings with the children of men, God is absolutely perfect. In fact, even in God's judging the wicked, even in God sending people to hell, God is just in doing so. He brings upon the soul of man what man deserves for his sin. In fact, if we all got right now what we deserve, we would be in hell. All of us, friends. And God would be perfectly just in doing that. But instead, in His grace, He sent Christ to save His people. And ultimately, we know the Scripture talks about the patience of God, so He holds back the wrath that is due unto us. He gives the wicked time, my friends. Time is ticking away. I exhort you, do not lose your soul for your sins. Do not continue on in your blindness. But my friends, behold the glory of Christ as it is revealed in the Gospel. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. And that text out of John 3 is speaking back to Numbers chapter 21, I think it is, where the Israelites had sinned against God. God sent a plague among them, a fiery serpents to bite them, poisonous snakes, and they were dying. And so Moses interceded on behalf of the Israelites, and God told Moses to erect 
a bronze serpent upon a, a pole, and whoever looked after they were bit by the snakes would have life. They would instantly be uh, completely relieved by any symptoms that might otherwise come upon them and kill them. Friends, that is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ has been raised up upon the cross and He satisfied the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God. And all who behold His glory through the eye of faith shall be saved from the power of sin. But going back to that idea, I was just commenting on the fact that God is righteous in all His ways. I specifically enjoy considering this passage oftentimes in the open air. In Psalm 119, it says in verse 137, it says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Again, God in His dealings with people, with, his, with sinners. My friends, God is just in doing so. No one can bring anything before God and say, What have you done? No one can stay His hand. No one can make an accusation against the Lord. For it shall not hold up, and it shall not stand. And that therefore brings verse 4 to a close. But we ask ourselves in contemplation of this God, of the God that is spoken of in Scripture, and in these verses, this faithful God, what are other attributes which He possesses? Who is the God of Scripture? Who is the God of glory who has made all things? Well, this God is a triune God. One God, yet three eternal persons. One being in essence and nature, yet three co-equal and co-eternal persons. The Father, the Son, the Spirit of God. Perfect in power and purity. In moral perfection, I talk about the holiness of God that speaks to His being set apart from all that is wicked. He, by His character and by His own intrinsic merit, defines what is righteous and defines what is good. God is also gracious and compassionate. He is patient with the wicked, as I, con as I considered that earlier and made mention of that earlier. We even see the grace of God playing out right now. The weather right now is just beautiful outside. Friends, that speaks to the grace of God. But the grace and mercy of God is not something that is to be trampled underfoot. It is something that ought to lead you to repentance. And specifically, it is the mercy of God, the kindness of God that is revealed in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Also, we know from 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. That's so true. But God's love never negates His holiness and never negates His justice. It never negates His righteousness. God is jealous for justice. Just as a good judge here in Greenville, South Carolina is jealous to administer justice, to punish evildoers, so is God. He is zealous for justice. He is zealous to execute justice upon the earth, my friends. Only far greater than any man could have a zeal for justice. And God, my friends, I want to share with you this concerning God. And you must understand this. You must understand the character of God. You must understand the law of God. You must understand your sin before God before you can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let me say this. Concerning the law of God, this is important. The law of God plays a very key role in understanding salvation. Because as we know from Romans 3.20, it is the law of God that brings about the knowledge of sin. And so the law of God is, as it were, a mirror for us my friends and it shows us two things specifically the law of God shows us the character of God and secondly it shows us the character of man in light of the character of God so we consider the commands God himself says you shall not lie and these are found in Exodus 20 God says you shall not steal uh, God says you shall not commit adultery or God says you shall not blaspheme. There's just four. Four out of ten commandments. We could look at six more. But there's just four. And as we consider these commands, we see the character of God unfold before us. We see it. Friends, for example, you shall not lie. The book of Hebrews tells us it is an impossibility for God to lie. My friends, it is against the character of God to bear false witness. That's why it is wrong. God Himself is not a liar. You shall not steal. That command, God, of course, it owns all things. It's His divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with, His, with what He owns. And surely God is not a thief. He doesn't have that moral imperfection upon Him. 
Or we consider the command, you shall not blaspheme. Again, that goes back to the character of God. God is morally perfect. And so when God gives that command, it shows us His character. Another one of the uh, commands of God is, is you shall not commit adultery. Now, why would God condemn such a thing? The reason God condemns that is because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. He's, a, he's perfect to keep His promises in all His ways. And so, therefore, for spouses to be unfaithful of one another is against the character of God. It offends God. And so we consider ourselves in light of the character of God. We consider our own sin in light of the, specifically the law of God. For example, we go back to the command, you, you shall not lie. You shall not lie. Have you ever lied before in your life? If so, I know that I myself have. So if you've lied before God, then you've sinned. You've sinned, you've brought that, you brought that sin upon your soul, that guilt. Or for, exa or for example, the command, you shall not steal. For example... Um, have you ever taken even a piece of food or something from someone that it, it belonged to them? My friends, that is sin. Or if you ever blasphemed, have you ever taken God's name and used it in a dishonorable manner? Oh, my friends, such a, such a sin is, gr is very evil, very grievous in the eyes of God. Or commit adultery. You say, listen, I've never committed adultery. Jesus came along in Matthew 5 and He says, if you look with lust... You commit adultery in the heart. Why would he say that? Why would he say God considers even the act of looking with lust as, a, as adultery? The reason is, is this. God sees the mind, friends, and it is about the heart. It's about the intents of the heart. And friends, God sees that it as perverse and wicked and evil. He sees that the heart of man is, as Jeremiah 17.9 says, it is deceitful, more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so we find ourselves having trampled God's law underfoot, having broken the, com the covenant of works, having broken the commands of God. And therefore we deserve the just penalty for it. Friends, you deserve the just penalty for your sins, just as a murderer or a rapist here in, in Greenville County deserves to be punished for their law breaking. How much more God, when we break God's holy law, do we deserve to be punished for our law breaking? So much more, my friends. We are so guilty, so perverse. In fact, Romans 1.30 says, concerning the lost, it says that they are slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of e evil, disobedient to parents. My friends, the, the state of man outside of the saving grace of Christ is not one of neutrality. It is one of deadness to sin and hate, excuse me, uh, deadness uh, to, to uh, spiritual life. And, and or it is deadness to sin in the sense that they're dead in sin and they're, they are haters of God, as Romans 1.30 says. And friends, therefore we find ourselves standing before the holy tribunal of God having broken His law. And our punishment, the just penalty we deserve is hell. It is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says it is a place of outer darkness. Jesus described it as a, as a place of eternal punishment. Jesus said it is a place where the, the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. Friends, I don't want you to go there. If I truly believe what the Bible has to say concerning hell, if I truly believe what the Scriptures say, I must warn you, out of a care for your souls, if you're walking down the street and you're going to step into a burning house and at any moment could fall upon you, I, I must warn you out of a love for you, out of a care for you. I must. And so, friends, therefore, believing what Scripture has to say, Believing what the Word of God has to say, I must warn you. I must plead with you. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Don't lose your soul for your eternal... Uh, for, don't lose it over any... Any sin in this life is not worth losing your soul over. No sin is. No temporal pleasure is worth eternal hellfire. So that's the bad news. That is the bad news. That is the very bad news. 
However, my friends, I can joyfully declare to you that God is rich in mercy, that God has a great love for His people. God has such a, a, a wonderful love for His elect. And so He sent His Son into the world. Jesus Christ, the eternal God-man, came down and, and became a man. He became man and dwelt among us and fulfilled the law of God on behalf of the people of God. He fulfilled the commands of God that we are broken. So Jesus says in Matthew 5, He says in Matthew 5, 17, I'll go there. He says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. My friends, Christ came to fulfill the commands of God, to fulfill the law of God on behalf of the people of God, so that we wouldn't have to for ourselves because we couldn't. We couldn't keep the law of God. No one can please God by, by keeping His law because even in our greatest moments, even in our greatest moments of righteousness, what do we see? That we're imperfect. That our, that our motives were even tainted by sin. So even what we consider good is not good in the, in the strict sense, in the full sense. And so therefore it pleased God at the fullness of the times, as Galatians 4.4 4 says, to send His Son into the world to save sinners. See, from the foundation of the world, the Father had set aside a people whom He would save. Out of the children of men, he, he predestined His elect unto salvation. And He covenanted with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He covenanted with Christ to save sinners, to come into the world. The agreement was that if Christ came and died for the people of God to redeem us from our sins, He would reign over the kingdom of God. He would reign on the, on the throne of His father David. And he would receive the full reward of his sufferings. And my friends, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has kept that covenant. He has been obedient to the will of the Father. He came down at the fullness of the times. He became flesh and dwelt among us, kept the law, as I said. And then he laid himself down as the, as the perfect sacrifice for sin. He laid himself down as the Lamb of God and bore the wrath of God against the people of God. At that cross, the Father counted Christ as if He was a sinner, though He was innocent. He counted His Son as if He was a guilty lawbreaker, though He was a perfect lawkeeper. That's the glory of the Gospel, that Jesus takes ownership of my guilt. Jesus takes ownership of my sin. I like the way the book of Galatians words this. It's very... It's very beautiful the way the book of Galatians words this. It says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, Christ I mean excuse me, Paul writes these words. He says, "Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree." Jesus Christ at the cross bore the wrath of God, the eternal curse that we deserve. That's why Isaiah 53, which by the way was written Around 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. And Isaiah 53 says this. In verse 4 it says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore, and our sorrows He carried. Yet we ourselves have seen Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed. I love it what verse 10 says. It says, but the Lord was pleased to crush Him. So Christ takes our sin upon Himself at the cross, takes the guilt of our iniquity, carries it there to that cross and hangs there as He's, as he's in agony. He even cried out the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The wrath of the Father was so great, He cried out in agony like that. And Isaiah 53.10 says it propitiated, it pleased the wrath, it absorbed the wrath of God. My friends, this is glorious. This is the gospel of grace that God would do that for His people. That Jesus Christ, out of a great love for His church. You know, I love what the, the command in, in Ephesians 5.25 when Paul tells the, the men at Ephesus, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Oh my friends, there was no greater example that the Apostle could appeal to 
than the example that Jesus set forth in His precious work at the cross. My friends, it is the power of God into salvation. I plead with you to flee to Christ and to believe the Gospel. Don't lose your souls for your sin. I would not stand out here on this, on this corner like this if I did not believe this, friends. If I, if I did not believe that your souls were in peril. Trust upon Christ whether you are young or old. Even the Scripture says we are to remember the Lord in our youth. So there is Christ having propitiated the wrath of the Father. And then, three days later, what happened? The Father rose Him up from the grave. He rose Him up as the public display that He had received His sacrifice as a sufficient payment for our sins. That Jesus had paid for our sin. And He is alive today. Never to die again, as Scripture tells us. After 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, Jesus bodily ascended into, into glory. He ascended into heaven. And, and the book of Hebrews says He sat down at the, at the right hand of the majesty on high. What glorious wording does the writer of Hebrews employ when describing Christ's exaltation? That's what he says in, in Hebrews chapter 1. He says in verse 3, And He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Friends, Christ reigns in heaven as the King of the universe, as the blessed Sovereign Lord. And the command of the Gospel, the call of the Gospel, is that sinners must repent and believe it. Those two things, repentance and faith. Repentance is an understanding of one's spiritual depravity. Their spiritual bankruptcy. You must see your sin. See yourself for who you are in light of the, of the holiness of God. And genuine repentance is a, is a resolution, a, 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 a deep-seated resolve within the soul of man to flee sin and to flee to the Savior. Flee your sins, my friends. And the second thing, belief. That is simply to take God at His Word. To grab hold of the promises of God as they are revealed in Holy Scripture. To believe as Abraham believed. To believe as the apostles believed. To believe the Word of God. And friends, the promise of the Gospel for those who repent and believe it is that God will pardon them of all their sins past and present and future. God will forgive them of all their transgressions and iniquities. That's why Jesus could say in Luke 24, 47, He says, or excuse me, I'll begin at verse 46. He says, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that, the, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. My friends, for the one who repents and believes the Gospel, God will forgive them of all their sins, past and present and future. Full pardon because of the, of the work of Christ. Full pardon because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. This is, this is glorious, my friends. Please, and I plead with you, using that terminology, my dear friends, because I care for your souls. I care for where you're going to go when you die. I don't want you to be crushed under the wrath of God in hell for your sins. Instead, trust upon Christ alone. Trust upon the fact that He satisfied the wrath of God for you, for your sins, if you're in Him. And friends, God not only will forgive the sins of the repentant, but God will wrap them in the righteousness of His Son. God will credit them with having lived Christ's life God will look upon them as if they had the righteousness of Jesus because He looked at Jesus as if He had their sin. That's the exchange of the Gospel. That Jesus takes my sin and I receive His righteousness. I receive the garment of His perfect righteousness to clothe me and that I might stand before God and be, be accepted in Him. You know, the New Testament employs that terminology. In Romans 8.1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, you have to be in Christ that is, you have to be wrapped in His righteousness. And that only comes by believing the Gospel. Believing that He died for you. See, saving faith is a personal faith. It's not just believing that Jesus died. 
for sinners, but believing Jesus died for me. He satisfied the wrath of the Father for me. And He has procured a perfect righteousness through His law keeping for me. Friends, that is the glory of the Gospel. God gives this all out of grace. Forgives the sinner, wraps him in the righteousness of His Son. All as a gift of grace. Ephesians 2.8, what does it say? For by grace you have been saved. Friends, salvation is out of the free mercy of God. Any salvation that requires you working for it is a salvation which you shall never attain. For by grace are you saved. God bless you, sir. Grace is the free mercy of God. It is the free unmerited favor of God. And that is the glory of the Gospel. No other religion in the world no other message has this. Because it requires something of the sinner. But my friends, salvation, as the Scriptures define it, the religion according to the Bible, the Word of God, is all out of the free mercy of God. Free, I tell you. And for the one who genuinely believes the Gospel, something is going to happen to them. I addressed this at the beginning. That those who genuinely believe on Christ, they will be changed. They will bear the fruit of that. Their thoughts, their words, their deeds, the intent of their heart, everything about them will be changed by the grace of God and for the glory of God. If someone says they know Christ, but they do not live for Him, they do not obey Him, it's because they never knew Him in the first place. It's not that they once had salvation and they lost it. It's that they never knew Him in the first place. Jesus said what in Matthew 7.20? You will know them by their fruits. You be dead. BJ, BJ boy. What's that? BJ boy. No, sir. Okay. I'm not. I'm a pastor. Thank you. I'm not with them. Thank you, sir. Oh, praise God. Yeah, I'd come down here, but it was a little bit further that way. I'd hand out tracks and preach. Mm, thank you. God bless this you. This was 50 years ago. <laughs> mm, mm. God bless you, sir. You have a good evening. And so, my friends, the one who truly knows, knows Christ will live for Christ. If you say that you know Him, yet you do not live for Him, you're lost. I can think back to my own life as a, as, as a false convert for eight years. I said I was a Christian, but I was a hypocrite. I didn't care anything about the Word of God, anything about prayer, anything about holiness, anything about sharing the Gospel with others. Why? It's because I was lost. I was spiritually dead. I had yeah, asked Jesus into my heart, quote and unquote, I had the religious experience, but my friends, it was not life-changing. It was some, some silly, empty ritual. My friends, and that's what many people have here in the biblical South, here in the Bible Belt. Many people have religious ritual, but they don't have salvation. Many people say they have Christ. They acknowledge Him with their lips, but their hearts are far, far from Him. And if you're one of those people, the call is the same. Repent and believe the Gospel. And this gospel is not only for the lost, not only for the religious hypocrite, it is for the child of God. It is for the genuinely regenerate child of God, for the true saint. It is for the believer, my friends. It is the daily bread for the child of God to feed upon, to grab hold of. It is the manna which God provides from heaven every day for His people to feed upon. The Gospel is the power of God, not only unto salvation, but to sanctification, and ultimately unto glorification. It is the Gospel which the child of God ought to rely upon for his or her daily sustenance. As I spoke on earlier, all true piety springs forth out of the Gospel. Any piety that is built upon any other motive is idolatry, and it is false religion. The only true piety before God, the only true holiness before God, is that which is built upon gratitude toward God for what He has done in His Son, Jesus Christ. It is by grace, all by the free grace of God, my friends. Sovereign grace. God is sovereign. He reigns over the universe and will accomplish His sovereign will according to His purposes. And my friends, He dispenses grace to the, upon those whom He wills. It is a sovereign grace and it is saving grace. To God be the glory for this grace.
It is all to the glory of God. I, I end off with this point every time I preach because it is so important. Salvation is not even ultimately about you or about me or about the church or about Christians. It is about the glory of God. God is jealous for His glory. God is jealous to bring praise and worship to His name. My friends, God will not share His glory with another as Isaiah 48 tells us. He will not. And so therefore, in the economy of salvation, it is all by grace so that God gets all the glory, so that God gets all the praise and all the honor and all the worship. Why did God make this world? Why did God make you and me? Why did God make the wicked and the righteous? Why did God decide to elect His people unto life and then to send His Son to die for them? Why did God, in His brilliance and in His wisdom, choose to do such a thing? For His glory. In fact, uh, right now, 500 years ago, what, did, what are we celebrating to, uh, this year? The 500 year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 500 years ago this year, on October 31st in 1517, a, a, a Roman Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And that sparked what is called the Protestant Reformation. One of the phrases that the reformers came up with during this Reformation in Europe was a phrase, it's a Latin phrase, and it's, it's, it's pronounced sola Deo Gloria. Sola Deo Gloria. And it means glory to God alone. My friends, God is ordering this universe to bring His name glory. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, verse 20, he says to the Ephesians, Now, to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. My friends, I give you strong exhortation. You pagans, you, you filthy sinners, my friends. I was once a filthy sinner. I'm not saying that out of name calling, but out of experience. My friends, run to the Savior Christ the Lord who cleanses you and who can save you from your sins. You religious hypocrites, flee to Christ for life eternal that your souls might be redeemed. And you Christians, my dear fellow saints, feed upon the Gospel and proclaim it to this lost and dying world to the glory of God. So in closing, we have seen here in Romans chapter 3 in verses 3 and 4 that the faithfulness of God is not thwarted by the unfaithfulness of man. No, my friends, it is not. And we have seen here, we've contemplated the truth of the Gospel that Christ saved sinners, that He died for His people and rose again on their behalf. My friends, Jesus is Lord. Believe upon Him. To Christ, the King of glory, be all glory and praise and honor forever. Amen. Amen and amen.